Right. Okay. We should be live on Facebook on Raptor Aid. Um, Hi, <laughs> Ed, thank you very much for joining us. Um, those of you that don't know, Ed Druitt is a naturalist superstar, knows all sorts about all sorts. He's wonderful. Um, I'm very fortunate to spend time with him in a Raptor study group that we're both involved in, in Ed's local area. And, and yeah, bit of a whiz on peregrines and prey remains. <laughs> Um, but we'll get on to 20, 22 years now. <laughs> Does that make you feel old? Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll yeah, we'll get on to we'll get on to peregrines in your books and urban peregrines in a in a bit. Um so it's dead straightforward, like I just said to you, Ed, and I'll hopefully get some questions in. I'll try and keep an eye on Facebook. Yeah, lovely. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you've got any questions on peregrines or raptors or just simply you know suddenly getting into watching urban peregrines get in touch and uh, see if i can help answer your questions that's what we that's what we want um okay well start from i always get people to start from the beginning as i mentioned yeah. to you um how yeah tell us a bit about how you got your love of nature how you got into it where was the start and uh yeah and then go go from there basically yeah yeah well begin? my love of, my love of nature really comes from uh when i well i can remember as far back as being six or seven and my grandma feeding the house sparrows and starlings when they used to be a lot more common back then um going to feed the ducks i come from surrey originally and in surrey you've got quite a lot of village ponds you don't see them in other parts of the country so much but in surrey you've got lots of little village or town ponds and so we used to go and feed the ducks very well almost every week you know with bread and things like that uh, i still remember watching coots you know just just vigilantly watching these coots nesting on the nest all that sort of stuff and then when i went to so i can remember being interested in nature when i was in in my first school when i was six seven mm -hmm. but then when i went to middle school in surrey in epsom in surrey my teachers really encouraged me um, to be into nature basically so I had this I had this passion and they encouraged me through sort of doing wall displays in the classroom uh, you know bringing in all sorts of skulls and things into the classroom I remember we found this pheasant wing uh, in the middle in, in our on, in a, the church that we used to do our church services at you know like like yeah. um, Christmas services and all that sort of stuff so we were we were there doing um, I think artwork or something and, and looking at lichens on gravestones and I found this wing of a pheasant when I was about 10. Yeah. <laughs> so even at 10 years old, I was interested in in prey remains of stuff. And, and I remember once we, it was a bit gruesome, but we found this Jay's head in our little nature reserve at our school, Ooh. brought it into the classroom. And then over the weekend, <laughs> it came back in on Monday morning and it was crawling in maggots, but never mind. <laughs> but anyway, that's all of the sort of stuff that has helped me be what I am. But I also remember we had these plum trees at school and back then green finches were much more common than they are today and the green finches would would feed in these plum trees and preen during during the summertime and they were molting their feathers and growing new feathers so as a 10 or 11 year old i'd pick up all their feathers and then bring them home and then try and lay them out in in the in the order that they would be in the wing you know yeah. and i had this, got this fantastic feather collection that i that i that i sort of cooked up as it were when i was eight nine ten eleven and it's my prize kind of feather collection they're in my dad's old cardboard kind of drill boxes that he used to get and i used to have these layers of cardboard with um cotton wool and and just lay the feathers out and they're still they're up in the loft now you know just as they were from from all those years ago so that's where it all began then because you <laughs> are a bit of a whiz really when it comes to feathers and identification so it is and actually my, is... my passion for peregrines comes from more from prey remains and what they eat so when i when i first went to bristol university to study zoology yeah 22 years ago it, it was the fact that on the pavement outside pizza hut in bristol <laughs> were these remains of all sorts of things that I didn't have the feathers of skulls of, you know, so I was dead yeah. excited to suddenly have this opportunity to to um, to get my hands on these feathers and skulls and that then and, and I was also thrilled to, to have peregrines in the middle of Bristol as well. I mean, yeah. the reason for going down there in the first place was the thrill of actually seeing peregrines, which I'd never really seen much of up until that point. And then it was this connection with what they were eating really so it was it was bringing together my interest then in skulls and feathers and what have you brilliant and so is that where 
actually, there was a question that came into my head before, which I'll I'll come to, which I'll do first. In terms of school, because I never had this, and I'm always jealous when people say this. I didn't really enjoy. I wasn't that fussed by school. Sure. I didn't enjoy it, but I didn't have a teacher that w- really encouraged it, and I wish I did. When I hear yeah. people say they had Mr. Jones or like Chris Packham talks of having one of his teachers and yeah. other people do, and did you have that? Did you have a I had, specific? I did. I had two teachers. I mean, actually, a lot of my a lot of teachers encouraged me, but I had two teachers in particular. One of them is dead now, sadly, but the other one I'm still in touch with. Um, so I had one teacher when I was eight years old, so my fir- uh, yeah first year at middle school. And yeah. so, um, so she really encouraged me and got me doing different yeah. things. As I say, wall displays, and uh, there was a particular book that she'd allow me to go outside of the classroom to read. And then when I went up from her to the next class, the next teacher who I'm still in touch with, she also encouraged me. I remember she used to, she used to live near Walton on the Hill in Surrey, and she also in we used to do write these daily journals, and she should. Nice talk to me about uh, the yellow hammer that she used to hear when she used to go horse riding and what have you yeah <laughs> things like really. that and that's another good skill that you've been t- you've been taught early then journal writing and stuff like yeah, that we used to have to do this uh, all throughout middle school we we used to do a journal um, every morning we'd, we'd have to write didn't have to be very long but we'd do we'd do it every morning it was, and that was throughout the whole of middle school we'd do that really yeah and it's and that- my- Oh, I'm sorry. My, my, just, my, my was, third and fourth year teachers in the school didn't encourage me so much in the same way, but they still, but they still um, supported me, I guess. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it just it just going back to the journal thing because it's funny at the end of every talk, and you, I'll give you, a, I'll preempt you here now. I ask the person a, one bit of advice to give someone wanting to get into raptor margin. and funnily enough, Eugene Potapov the last talk we did Dr Eugene Potapov picked up his journal on his desk and held that up and said this is write a journal every time you're out in the field write a journal and it's one thing I'm not very good at actually (laughs) I have to admit um yeah I've I've gone sort of up and down with it really I mean throughout throughout I've got some fantastic bird notes in pads that I've written throughout my 20s and then I went out of doing it and then I've gone back into doing it out of doing it what I do do a lot these days is I try and submit a lot of my bird sightings on the British Trust of Ornithology's bird track app yeah. um, because I can just do it there and then and I've got two young children now so, so trying to write it out by hand is much harder but what I do still have is I have a daily journal of, of the garden birds that we see and I submit nice. sightings to the BTO's garden bird watch so I still do that but but yeah you're right and, and also I have um I have books where I write down all my peregrine related prey studies and stuff like that really you know so um brilliant okay so university peregrines outside pizza hut um yes. <laughs> that sounds i mean that, that sounds like my perfect peregrine it's no exaggeration pizza so. hut here this tall <laughs> building called um castle me tower it's still there was here and then the play remains on the pavement below and i'm just like that- that would be perfect. The pizza in one and binoculars in the other, peregrines, magic. Anyway, um, so were peregrines the first raptors that really you got into, or were there any was there anything before? No, sparrowhawks, that? actually, sparrowhawks, first of all. So when I used to live in Surrey, uh, we had woodland and, and common land uh, on the other side of the road from us. So when I every day I'd go into the woods after school. And uh, so I got very familiar with the calls of young sparrowhawks. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was back in the 90s, really. So sparrowhawks were still sort of coming back, I guess. So in July, August time, I'd always hear the, the screaming calls of the babies. I could never see the darn things, but I could always hear them. And one, one year I found the plucking post of one of the adult birds. And so that was really exciting because I was finding feathers of blue tit and great tit, goldfinch, long tailed tit. I can still remember finding it in now. I can yeah. still remember the excitement of finding this 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 plucking area, you know, this plucking post. Mm. So sparrow hawks definitely. And then I I saw, I saw my first peregrine in in 1990 when I was 10, 11 years old. No, it was 1991, sorry, at Yat Rock. So although I come from the southeast, I I visited Herefordshire with some with um with a friend that lived up the road. Saw my first peregrine then, and little little did I know that seven or eight years later I'd then be. You know watching them in more detail really but i'd say i'd say i grew up with sparrowhawk and kestrels more so really yeah. buzzards in in back in in the 90s and the noughties we didn't have any buzzards we do now but no buzzards we had no red kites 
Um, so really, really back in the 90s, it was just Kestrels. They were still doing pretty well then. And Sparrowhawk, that was it. Yeah, a lot of, funnily enough, we've, we've probably talked about, I don't know, 12 or 14 people now on this. And Sparrowhawk comes up a lot as people's bird that they you know, remember the most, it yeah, was yeah. one of the first birds for monitoring anywhere, you know, and finding nests or observing them, you know, different behaviours and so on. So, yeah, it's quite interesting. And it's almost like, I suppose, sparrows have dropped off the radar. I always think, I don't have enough time looking for sparrows. They want dropped off a bit, bit of the radar for some people. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, they were always every year regular in the woods, you know, um, and the young calling in June, July time, really. But I don't, having moved more, well, to Bristol, first of all, I did I did um, manage to find a nest at the University of Bristol, actually, back in about 2003, we had a nest actually in the gardens at the University oh. of Bristol. That was really cool. And I actually remember going there early one morning and actually seeing the male and female collecting nest material. And it was the weirdest thing, seeing this, this majestic bird of prey, woodland bird of prey, with sticks in its beak. <laughs> It didn't look right. Yeah, yeah. So that was really cool. But I live in the Forest of Dean now, and I've got to admit that um, we have a regular sparrowhawk, but I'm not. I don't really see or hear that much of them. I don't. Um, there's a pair not too far from us, about 20 minute walk away, where I have heard them calling, and there, there is obviously there's definitely a territory in a nest there. But yeah. I definitely don't. I don't have the same relationship with the sparrowhawk that I had when I was growing up. Definitely not. Well, that's because you, you're in the heart of the bigger cousin, aren't you, there? So, uh, yeah, keep, the sparrows, keep, their head, keep their heads down a bit, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, I remember one of my most vivid childhood memories was sitting on the playing field by, and in the village we used to live and a sparrowhawk coming over the top of the head right in front of us, seeing us, swerving off and dropping wow. a blackbird. And it had a blackbird in its oh. feet and it dropped it. And then flew off, and of course, all, we all scrambled over to the to the blackbird <laughs> to poke it and have a look. And it was obviously long deceased, and we left it and moved on. But yeah, that and that's there's a, that was yeah one of my first memories. So they are wonderful. Yeah, uh, good. actually, about, about a month ago, I was just out. It was in the evening, just getting dusky, and I was out. I got a little three year old, and we were just out. And at dusk, this sparrow, I could hear all this screaming sound, and this sparrowhawk was flying across the open space at the back of us with a live blackbird still in its talons. Oh, wow. <laughs> My three-year-old, you know, was taking it all in, you know, like, is it, still, is it still alive, Daddy? <laughs> no, it is still alive, yes, but it's not going to be for very long, much sooner, I'm afraid. <laughs> wow, what a, what a thing to see at three years old. That's awesome. I know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so peregrines, obviously, have, have, have made up. When did, when is it, was it Bristol? And they really started to become a big part. Yeah, of Yeah, so so back in 1998, when I went to Bristol, I there was a chap called John Tully. He's not alive anymore now, but he basically had already been studying the diet of peregrines in Bristol, and he had set up the the Bristol Ornithological Club had set up um, a peregrine watch in the 1990s because back then peregrines were more vulnerable to being um, persecuted in the Avon Gorge, mm -hmm. and so. The BOC had set up this watch, etc. So by the time I came in 1998, that was all quite well established. Yeah. And I was really, I was really an eager student, really, and I really wanted to see see wild peregrines in Bristol. So John took me down to the city centre in Bristol and showed me them, and um, he helped me sort of collect the prey, and and it kind of went from there, really. Oh, yeah. I kind of took over. He was getting to a point in his life where I think he was he was wanting to sort of pull back a bit on peregrine staff and and giving talks in the evenings about birds you know he was he was retired and just wanted to sort of pull back a bit so it yeah. was an opportunity for me to to move yeah. forward with it yeah Excellent. and to be honest really looking back now 20 years um I think I was just I was just you know you often hear this it's a bit of a cliche but I was there at the right place at the right time I don't think a young 18 year old would have the same almost like relationship or opportunity with peregrines today yeah. because there are peregrines everywhere today and there's people everywhere watching yeah. them. But back then you have to remember that the only people really watching peregrines in urban locations was um, somebody in Exeter, a few Nick Dixon, a few people down in Sussex, uh, Graham Roberts, for example, Dave Morrison in, in London, and that's about it. Mm. 
Whereas now there's, you know, there's over a hundred kind of town and city locations, each with their own kind of like champion group, which is fabulous, of course. But I don't think I would have, I, I was very lucky, I think, to be there just at the right place at the right time to sort of um, establish, I guess, a, a certain place with, with studying peregrines. So, yeah, I suppose that's an interesting question, really. When So w w I don't think I've ever asked or thought about this question because, um, yeah, I've, I've just taken it for granted. Peri urban peregrines, when were really, when did the phenomenon, if you want to call it that, start? Where, they, when so it started to happen in the late 90s. So in the late 90s, you had birds in Exeter, Chichester, Brighton, um, right. possibly in London, and that was about it. Um, yeah. So then when we got to the noughties, to the 2000s, you had them in places like Bath, for example. Um, I think you were starting to get some birds in the London area. But again, you know, that was about it. Yeah. Then when we get to the mid 2000s, um, they were definitely starting to appear in many, many more places by this point. Um, so, yeah, but certainly I, I would say sort of mid, mid to late 90s was when they really started to appear in, in, in key, key urban locations. Yeah. And then it was the early 2000s that they really started to nest in places like Bath. And then it's from those places they've sort of spread out, really. You know, so throughout the two, I would say that it, re it really started to, urban locations really started to get covered by peregrines during the 2000s. That's, that's when the, the coverage just went poof, blanket, you know. Probably, probably from about 2005 more, I'd say. I'd say it was still quite slow up until about 2004, five. And then I'd say I'd say in the last fifteen years it's just really gone, you know. Yeah, spiked. Yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah, gone up. Was there again? I don't know the answer to this. So I'm going to ask you. Was there any? Was this known well enough in other countries? It, it wasn't something that was unique to the UK. I'm assuming America, maybe. Where was it happening? Yeah. <laughs> so in America, I think urban peregrines were more established but i think really across the whole world it happened around very similar times to be honest right when you we, i went to a peregrine conference in 2007 and it was very clear that peregrines were creeping into urban locations but it, it seemed to be a very western european thing so although it was happening in um eastern european countries generally then and actually even now a lot of peregrines there are still quite sort of mountain mountain birds actually they're still there are some urban birds for example in Hungary and Romania but but generally they're much more rural mountain birds so the urban phenomenon is there but it's much more of a western European thing the Netherlands France Germany a bit of Poland Switzerland you know Spain and what have you but it really all happened about the same sort of time Germany and Britain have got the highest kind of peregrine populations in, in Europe, certainly in Western Europe. So as you might imagine, they've got the sort of highest numbers of pairs using towns yeah. and cities. Um, Germany as well. Germany's probably got some of, some of the... Germany's probably got the most number of pairs using not just towns and cities, but also industrial locations. Okay, well, yeah. Cooling towers, yeah. power stations, that sort of stuff. But as you go further east towards Russia, you find less and less urban birds. That's partly, I think, because there's less of them and they're less, they're less dense. Yeah. You know, what have you. But I think for them, the phenomenon's everywhere, all around the world, Australia, South America. You know, I was in Argentina, yep. in the capital back in, uh, when was it, February last year. And, you know, there's peregrines using big, high, tall towers. And those aren't breeding. I think they're birds from very southern Argentina that were wintering in the city um in uh, Buenos Aires but but nonetheless still is still using the city still using yeah but yeah. I'd say when you look at the histo history books though um Britain's got some of the earliest records of urban peregrines so there's peregrines that would have used Salisbury Cathedral in the mid 1800s there's records of birds using the Natural History London Society have got records of peregrines using St Paul's Cathedral in the early 1900s oh, wow. and in Germany they've got records of peregrines using their kind of fabulous old castles in the 1930s and 1940s so but it was still very occasional then it wasn't until the post post-war post DDT pesticide mm -hmm. era that peregrines really sort of came back with a boom and what we think's happened to it is they've saturated rural, uh, coastal and rural locations and then really come into towns and cities, really. 
And that's, yeah, it's interesting to hear those historical um, points because one of the, probably the things I get thrown at me a lot by anyone who's anti peregrines in urban areas, usually some someone relating to the pigeon fancying fraternity, uh, mm. is that, oh, it's not natural, they shouldn't be there. When actually, if you're talking about them being, you know, utilising, not necessarily nesting on on buildings in the 1900s, then it, it couldn't be any more natural, could it? No, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, what we what we don't know, of course, is is you know before records began as well. You know, birds of prey, uh, you know, have gone through quite a tough time really over the last sort of three or four hundred years. But prior to that, um, they were regarded very highly in society and yeah. so actually it's quite possible that before records began um they were using some of some places like, i mean Tewksbury abbey may well have been used by peregrines 500 600 years ago before they went through that phase of of being on the wanted list you know kind of thing so um yeah we just we just don't don't know that really. I'm very optimistic that that um, peregrines are probably doing the best they've ever done today. Um, but actually, if we go back in time before they were persecuted and, and used for taxidermy and um, you know t taken out by gamekeepers, etc., that, that hopefully they were doing much better than what they are today. I seem to have lost you a bit there, Jimmy. <laughs> Well, hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get Jimmy back in a moment. It looks like that uh, he'll call back in a moment. But yes, if if you are watching Peregrines or you've got Peregrines close to where you are, where, wherever you are in urban locations, really, it's worth looking out for them. Uh, young birds are starting to fledge now, and uh, so are quite noisy uh, when they're calling mum and dad for food, and also just much more visible. And actually over the next month, they'll be flexing their wings, exercising. Mum and dad will be bringing in food for them and letting that food go, sometimes alive, sometimes dead, which the young peregrines will then be chasing after. So it's a fabulous time now to go to a city or a town near where you are and, and actually to keep an eye out and watch uh, for peregrines. Uh, or, or of course in your rural areas as well, but a lot of um, town and city peregrines are often ahead of rural peregrines in terms of when they are nesting. So the Bath peregrines, for example, actually fledged just early this week, um, which is potentially a month earlier than peregrines that might well be fledging from quarries here uh, in the Forest of Dean, for example. So there's lots of exciting stuff coming over the coming weeks or so. And perhaps actually also more interesting than, than if you'd been watching peregrines just solely on a webcam, uh, on a nest because of the fact that actually when they're flying around and screaming around there's lots of interactions between them and often other birds like for example urban gulls like herring gulls lesser fatback gulls etc so it's definitely worth um, getting out and about and looking for um, those young peregrines which are going to be fledging over the coming weeks now I'm not sure what's happened to Jimmy let's just have a little look and see whether he's going to come back with this ah here he comes now Ah, you're back, Jimmy. <laughs> Keep going. I kept going there, so hopefully. <laughs> I, I, sorry about that. And my Wi-Fi is dreadful today. And then I was like, oh, I've dropped out. So I assumed it would cut you out. And then I've looked at Facebook, and you're still talking on your own. So you're an absolute <laughs> professional. That is brilliant. Sorry, I, I, I heard a bit about you talking about dropping food. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was just, I was just talking about the fact that. Um, now is the, is is a fabulous time to get out and about and see peregrines because they're just starting to fledge it is their most dangerous time of their perhaps their when they're actually leaving the nest and from an urban peregrine point of view it can be uh, the most nerve-wracking because they often end up grounded and have to be put back up but but actually that doesn't always happen in bath this year so far fingers crossed all four chicks have fled successfully without grounding and usually we don't go a single season without that happening so goodness knows how it's it's happened this year and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they continue to stay in the air but I was just saying about the fact that it is so exciting at this time of the year because the peregrines are wheeling around they're learning how, they're, how to use their wings mum and dad are bringing in live prey dead prey 
letting them go for the chicks to kind of capture themselves and so it's a very exciting period and then once we get into August September time it really quietens off because those young birds start to disperse and start to move a bit further field. Yeah right I mean I've we <clears throat> my city as you know I've, I've told you a bit little bits about it um Chester we've luckily there's always been peregrines about uh, but the con first confirmed breeding where chicks fledged was 2017 um, on top of the lead shot tower and uh, and yeah and then they've they, yeah so they had three 2017 three 2018 three 2019 this year they've had four but anyone who's been following fe our facebook yeah. will know that there was one grounded on wednesday night that we got called out to and then this morning i went and picked it up so we're gonna try and get that back up onto a building um yeah to, after i finish this we just, <laughs> um so uh so yeah it's uh fa thanks for thanks for filling in in there but they are they're That's so right. exciting to watch in cities aren't they and one of the things I, I don't know about i'll ask come to you ask you one of the things i love is the passers-by when we do the peregrine watch they don't really they're out shopping they don't care they're not really interested they might be a little bit intrigued why there's binoculars and the minute they set eyes on a peregrine their whole day changes and they're like this is the best thing i've ever seen yeah and absolutely it's so wonderful to see that happen absolutely you, i mean i've been, I've been quite happens. discreetly um down at castle park in bristol recently um monitoring peregrines and doing it as part part of my job and um you know you, you don't have to stand there very long before people are wanting to know what you're looking at and and they might know that there's peregrines there so they're, they're interested to know how they're doing and where they're at it really is quite, you know, I had it yesterday. I was down there yesterday and, um, sorry, two days ago. And, you know, just stood there with my binoculars, just keeping an eye on them. And people just, people, you're, you're almost like a magnet. <laughs> people come over and want to know what's going on, where they are, you know, what they are sometimes if they don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah it's quite an incredible experience, actually. No, it is, I, If I was just stood there looking at the starlings on the lawn, everyone would just walk past. But there's something about the fact you're just looking at, <laughs> <laughs> at at yeah. the building seems to uh, uh, people behave differently towards you. Yeah, I've, I've, um, yeah, I've experienced. Yeah, I've had, had people just being at, at, like over the moon, and they're like, "This has made my day." That you know, we were just out shopping. We never knew there was peregrines here. So it's a, it's yeah, it is a wonderful, and people really buy into it. And that's why I think urban peregrines are so valuable. Some people. As, say to me oh you know should they be there shouldn't they be there and I'm like the, the amount the the, the the reach that they have for people who don't normally yeah. think about birds of prey and predators is fantastic absolutely and actually over the last 10 weeks with the lockdown you no know, they're about the only species that has really had you know regular webcam that people have been able to follow over the last six weeks and wherever you are whether you're in the southeast the southwest northern england you know there's been a, a web camera for you as it were but there's not really any other accessible bird of prey species i can think of where you can do that at these days kestrels are getting scarce and even if they nest in a church it's often inaccessible buzzards and sparrowhawks are very much woodland species where you can't really get cables to yeah you know peregrines have become this amazing predictable you know i always say to people if you're visiting bristol you're more likely to see a peregrine these days than you are a sparrowhawk buzzard or kestrel i mean that's saying something yeah. and um you know during this lockdown you know i think a lot of people 700 people the other day voted for the names of the salisbury peregrines oh, wow. <laughs> 700 people i which i just think is amazing that you know so they've really been a, something that people have really followed and wanted to follow really and i and i think it's the longevity as well because you can have a camera on a blue tit nest box which is lovely but you know the parents are incubating for two weeks not doing very much and then the youngsters are only in the box for two weeks and then they're gone Mm -hmm. um whereas with the peregrine it's much more drawn out you know the eggs are being laid at the end of feb uh, end of um end of march which people often love to see okay the incubation period is quiet and the bird isn't doing much but even so people still like seeing that happen um and then throughout the whole of kind of um uh when, yeah, may and and first half of june you know you've got them them, them growing up so it's, the, it's a really nice period that people can really watch them over you know 
Yeah, no, it, they, they, I think they, they bring a lot of enjoyment and, yeah, inclusivity to a lot of people. Now, I've got a qu question, but before we come to this, because it kind of links in it's, it, to something else we're going to talk about, um, your book. Show yeah. us the book yeah. again. Uh, so it's my book. Urban Paris. So the reason I wrote it was that in 1993, Derek Ratcliffe, I wish I'd met him, but but an incredible man, made the link with his team between why birds of prey were declining and, and DDT and pesticides. And he wrote a fabulous book. I mean, it's like, you know, I use it all the time, The Peregrine Falcon. But in his, it's over 300 pages long. And there's about a page devoted to kind of talking about urban peregrines. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Because back then, of course, when he wrote that book, there was they weren't really urban do you know what I mean I mean you know I said to you that they started to come into places late 90s well his book was published mid 90s you know so by the time he'd actually written it and got it to the publishers it was yeah. there, were, there weren't really any urban peregrines so in 2014 actually 2013 12 I put the book together and really what I wanted to do was that I I was very conscious that there was lots of information about urban peregrines out there in papers often foreign papers from from around the world um, but there was nowhere where they were that was brought together yeah. and although there's quite a lot of open access papers these days certainly back then even 2014 there wasn't and a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know or want to access some of those papers anyway because they're not always the easiest to read yeah so so really i just felt that it was it was time you know we knew enough and it was time to be able to write a book about urban peregrines dwelling peregrines it's written for the non-expert so it's written in a sort of it's not it's written for the non-expert but it's still scientific in the sense that it's, it's still going through the whole biology and how to study urban peregrines but but it's not written in a sort of dry way you know it's written yeah. hopefully in a, in a in a in a very accessible way and it doesn't shy away from, you know, talking about conflicts. It, 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 you know, it does also talk about perhaps how we can all work together to to consider peregrines as well, you know, and, and thinking about man's influence and impact on peregrines. But yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and no doubt since I even since I wrote this six years ago or had it published six years ago, there's there's more to add to it, I'm sure, since then. But uh, hopefully this is the kind of first in, 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 you know, perhaps other publications that will come out about about urban peregrines, really. Well, you look for, there you go, you've just lined yourself up for a <laughs> second edition. There is a second, of, yeah, of, of, I mean, the second book, I've yeah. got another book coming out now, which kind of relates to urban peregrines, which is all about the, identifying the prey remains of raptors. So obviously over the last 20 years, I've become very, very good at identifying the most minuscule of feathers from a bird. And so I've got a bird called Raptor Prey Remains coming out, a book even, not a bird, <laughs> book yeah. called Ra Raptor Prey Remains coming out this month. Uh, it was delayed by a few months because of um, COVID-19. And what it is, it's a photographic book. Uh, and it's the first step for somebody that finds feathers or a head or legs or wings on their lawn. Or if you're actually a raptor specialist going to a nest of a bird. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not the kind of, it's the first step of giving you how you are most likely to find that, that, that bird mainly yeah. birds it does have some mammals in there as well like rabbit and and um frog and toad and and other things but it's mainly birds yeah because those are the things that people generally find find the most of and also can be the more the more challenging to identify yeah so it's the first step and over the last 20 years i've become very accustomed to what it is you're most like to find of a teal duck or a blackbird or um a woodcock and that's what's illustrated in the book and then there, there is information in the book that can help you go to the next level, go to something like another book or a website like Featherbase to actually then go to the next step of identifying it or or, or, or going more in depth, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. So that's well, coming I, out that, this month. That, that, the Urban Peregrine book's brilliant. I, and I, I, I think it's a real credit to you, Ed, because it's so, I think, it, again, it is so important to, to be able to condense all that scientific hard hardness and, and it is you know it's intense some some of the papers in and and also you know who doesn't like looking at an, a good picture of a peregrine and that beautiful, book beautiful photographs in there as well yeah. I mean, that's one thing i'm really proud of because when you're doing a book like this you know you're doing it for love not money um but there were some fantastic photographers i mean the cover photograph is by sam hobson who taken some beautiful images of of peregrines in bristol and bath 
but all throughout the book actually people were very generous in in providing photographs of of urban peregrines and um which 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 just really enhances the book when people are reading it and looking at it really you know you yeah. know it is it's a it's a credit to you and i i look forward to seeing the the prime range one because it does <laughs> it does interest me it's, I, I suppose it's one of them morbid things isn't it that you yeah you, but, you, I, but I, hope just... it's also, I hope it's also a beautiful book for people because although it does have lots of dead things in it there's also some beautiful photographs i've got some beautiful photographs of um teal duck feathers against the black background really with the beautiful green um secondary color there's there's some beautiful photographs of pheasant feathers and partridge feathers in there and other things as well so it's I hope that it's also a beautiful book in yeah, terms yeah. of what it's providing and although it does have some perhaps more gory things in there <laughs> um I think I hope that the way it's set out actually it feels it feels appropriate rather than yeah <laughs> yeah macabre oh, right yeah. so well this kind of leads us on to the question there's this this scallywag Gareth Jones has uh <laughs> has asked what is the largest prey item you have found? And What's I assume large... it means by species. I don't. Yeah, I, I think but... so. Yeah. So it's a really good question. So you have to remember that a that a female peregrine falcon weighs over a kilogram. She's a big bird. Male bird is slightly smaller, hence its name, tearsel, kind of two thirds yeah. of the size of the female. And yeah. I, I, my specialist area has been studying the diet of urban peregrines. So you have to remember that a lot of prey that peregrines are taking, we think, are being brought in from from outside. They are taking pigeons and starlings and some birds, like even like kingfishers, for example, in some parts of Derbyshire in the city. But we know that they're going out of the city. So they have to be able to carry big prey back. And some of that big prey is just too heavy. So we know, for example, that out in the countryside, they will take things like widgeon duck. They will sometimes take little egrets. I've, I've got more than one record of people writing to me and telling me that they've taken down little egrets. They are known to take things occasionally like small geese and grey herons. Um, from my own studies, the largest prey they've taken have been ducks mainly. So I remember in Bath, um, we found the remains of a gadwall duck, which is kind of about the size of a mallard duck. Uh, in Bristol, I have actually found the feathers of widgeon duck. So mainly duck sized birds, you know, they're kind of around a similar weight to a wood pigeon. So, um, and generally taken by the female, but they're, they're still quite hefty things to be bringing back, you know, a kilometre or two into a city or so. Anything bigger than that, like maybe a heron or an egret or even a small goose, I think will get eaten in situ in the countryside. Yeah. Absolutely. The smallest bird has been yeah. gold, things like gold crest and wren. They do very occasionally take those. More often they take things like blue tit, great tit, um, even chiff chaffs, willow warblers they will take amazingly. Um, so so probably the male taking those. Yeah. But yeah. So the whole yeah. spectrum. What one of the first peregrine sites under license I was lucky to be invited to and go along to many years ago, but I'll never well I'll never forget it for two reasons. It was at a cement work, so it was filthy. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, up, uh, up one of the lift shafts. Um, and then we got up to the nest and there was a uh, there was a kingfisher head in it. And I never forget it. And I was absolutely blown away by the fact that obviously you, you, for me, me, your imagination starts running away. Yeah. And you think, wow. Imagine that flight, a tear, a tear suffering, a male taking a kingfisher. But yeah, yeah you, you think about. And I've spoken you know, to, to people from from Yat Rock. Um, I think Steve Watson particularly. And, um, you know, peregrines are actually have been seen almost like lining up with the king fisher to then grab it and most recently in Belper in Derbyshire they've been taking some urban kingfishers um, and again you know seeing them in the talons of the, of the peregrine is quite remarkable really. they don't be. take you know they don't take kingfishers that often um, no. most sites maybe have one or two a year but in Belper they seem to specialize and that's the interesting thing actually is that peregrines different peregrines do specialize if you talk to a falconer who flies a peregrine they will always tell you it specializes on rooks or magpies or pheasants whatever and it's the same thing with wild peregrines so for example in salisbury the pair there specialize on black-headed gulls i've had swifts uh, i've had peregrines in exeter specialize on swifts um and then as i say in belper kingfisher so although they they take a wide variety of other prey as well they do seem to develop their own little taste for something as well I mean, yeah yeah absolutely woodpeckers so in Cheltenham they like to eat great spotted woodpeckers see that's another <laughs> that's another one I mean you don't you 
a lot of people wouldn't consider a woodpecker. They consider them a woodland bird. I'm looking out my window now. There's a woodland just there, and you you see them hopping about the trees. You don't imagine seeing them out in the open sky where a peregrine's going to take them. Um, but they so, do. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah but the, the other thing with the prey, though, is it's a real detective story. And one of my most most interesting ones was was I found these these very small wing coverts very small feathers, orangey coloured, from corncrake in Bath back in the early noughties. Um, I knew they were corncrake, but I could never get the county bird recorder to accept them because nobody else had that specialist knowledge of what these feathers would yeah. be. But fortunately, um, corncrakes do get taken occasionally by peregrines other places. So I ended up quite a few years later, I think it's about eight years later, having some okay. more feathers of known corncrake. And then I was able to match them, match them with these ones that were taken earlier in 2002 in Bath and finally got it accepted about eight years later. <laughs> now talking about corn feathers. talking about corncrake, when when would they be taking the corncrake then? As it's migrating moving in the evenings? You, yeah, usually usually they're taking things like corncrake in September, October time when they are migrating south back to Africa. We don't seem to get them picked up in the spring migration. It seems to be more okay. the autumn migration. And one of the things that I've helped discover is, and, and prove really is that peregrines hunt at night. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I'm most proud of. So in the 1980s, there was a guy, um, I've forgotten his name now, but in, in Berlin, and he had um, started to sort of collect prey remains that were, that were inkling towards nocturnal my, hunting. Then when I came on the scene, I started to find lots more prey remains of birds like woodcock, little grebe, water rail, birds that would be difficult for the peregrine to catch during the day, but were all known to migrate at night and could be taken by the peregrine at, at, at night. Mm -hmm. And then with the advent of technology, Derby Cathedral finally had footage of the peregrines there bringing in prey such as snipe, woodcock, teal at night. And then yep. since then, we've had lots of other evidence of it. So peregrines are, they're probably doing this anyway on moonlit nights. And then with, with the advent of street lamping shining up into the night sky and lighting up migrating prey, um, they've been able to, to exaggerate and do that behaviour much more. So we think yep. that things like corncrake are being taken on, on this autumn migration. As the, and they're not taken in big numbers, but just every, every, every year or every other year, they might get taken in somewhere like Derby or Exeter. Yeah, the impact yeah. on the population, I'm sure, is very, very minimal. But what a wonderful, what a wonderful piece of behaviour to to be part of, Absolutely. you know, understanding and just you know pioneering the sort of discovery of it. Well, I think uh, I think up to up till the 2000s, you know, it's always been very much about the peregrines are fastest bird, one of our fastest birds in the world. Well, you know, actually, it is. But it's also this 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 nighttime hunter as well, yeah. you know, like an owl, and that for me adds another dimension and, and another part of the story of the peregrine that that we've only really been able to prove in the last sort of fifteen years or so, if that. Do so you ever? Thing. How often? Sorry, this has just come into my head while yeah. to interrupt you while we're talking about nocturnal bats. How do they appear in the diet frequently? Yeah, they do. Less so in Britain, but if you go to somewhere like Germany, where nocturnal bats are highly migratory and very visible, particularly during the day, then they appear a lot in the diet of the peregrine. And if you go to somewhere like Hungary, where bats are far more common, and, and nocturnal bats come out in the day, I've seen them in 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 um, Budapest very easily during the day. Then again, they also feature in the peregrine diet. Here in Britain, less so, but they do still appear. So I've had records in Bath, um, in Exeter, nocturnal bat, pipistrelle bat, Wakefield. So they do take bats, but much less, they seem to be much less important in the diet. I think that's just because there's less bats around in Britain. We have a slightly cooler climate. A lot, many of them are, are obviously in danger because of um, ha ha how perhaps we, we, we tidy things up in this country with our roofs and woodlands. So I think there's just this, and also there's a warmer climate in Hungary and Germany and places like that. So I think there's just, there's just more bats around, more insects to eat in those countries. So they do eat them, but, but in this country, they're primarily a bird, a bird eating specialist, really. So that moves us on. Well, it's kind of nicely. Another question. What's the most unusual prey item? if you can think of one or yeah, two. Yeah, really good question. So I think the one, we've had, we recorded over 100 species in Britain now, the peregrines feeding on, on all manner of different different sorts of things. 
I think some of the unusual ones are things like night jars that they take, although that links very nicely with the, the nighttime hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always been in London for some reason. There's been two night jars certainly taken in London, no doubt flying at night and catching the, the light from street lamps and the peregrines kind of capturing them really. Yeah. Um, coots are quite unusual in the diet. So they take things like water rails and, 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 and more hens quite often. Um, but not coots. My theory is that coots are, are darker plumage, more darker plumage than the water owl or moorhen. So they're less likely to be spotted at night under the street lamps. Um, they're not a rare prey item, but they're uncommon. Um, oh, um, and the other thing actually on the, on the, on the, on the note of the, of the rails, which is what a coot is, is um, spotted crake. So spotted crakes are a really super secretive rail <clears throat> that aren't very common in Britain, but they also get taken during that nocturnal migrating period. So I'd say those are some of the those are some of the rarer runs, really. Um, trying to think what else really, you know, various different wading birds and um, you know woodland birds, things like that. Roseate terns occasionally get nobbled, but really it's a it's a whole spectrum of different stuff, you know. Yeah, well, oh, clearly, yeah. obviously, yeah, across over 100 species. I know, I know following Nick Dixon's stuff down in Exeter as well, he's, he's got a huge yeah, library right. of, of, um, but I think yeah, when you, when you study the peregrines long stories. enough, like I have, you do see patterns of different things. So you do notice things like black tailed gobwit, golden plover, lapwing appearing in the diet more and more. Once you get a bigger sample size, you do see that mm. although they have a, a huge range in their diet, there are certain species that, that are either easier to catch or are just more prevalent in the environment, you know. So avocets, for example, I mean, avocets, as they're increasing in numbers, are appearing more and more frequently now in, in the urban peregrine diet. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so you, now I have to talk about some other birds. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Yeah. Um, you don't you mentioned BTO bird track. I know you're a big, big um supporter of the bto the british trust for ornithology yeah, heavily involved in <laughs> various schemes and pro projects yeah there you go oh really okay um, <laughs> so other birds that you you get your kicks out of what what else are you into monitoring at, um doesn't have to be raptors Cuckoo, cuckoos at the moment i love cuckoos um one thing that really, really makes me very sad or frustrated is the declining, uh, decline in our insect populations, but also, uh, but also then how that impacts our birds, rural birds, for example. So many of our farmland birds, but also woodland birds as well. And I'm old enough to, you know, remember when some of these birds were more common. I mean, actually, when I was growing up, things like turtle dove were already slipping away quite quickly. Yeah. But, you know, I have seen willow warblers disappear from many of my childhood haunts in Surrey, for example. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, cuckoo. So, so for me, I really, really feel sad that we're losing our cuckoos, you know, due to, a, you know, a number of different reasons, really. They love hairy caterpillars. We've lost a huge number of our moths in the countryside. So there's less food for them. Their journey to Africa, to the Congo, may also obviously have, have much more obstacles and dangers than, than it once would but yeah cuckoos and but also just here in the forest of dean i'm just i just really really love the fact that here in the forest of dean we've still got lots of species that have disappeared in many other parts of the country so you know at the back of my garden we've got you know nesting garden warblers for example which is just fabulous we've had you know half a dozen breeding willow warblers this year um we get woodcock roading over the house so for me it, it, it's 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 that it's having that variety in those specialists still in, in, in a wonderful kind of mosaic habitat that we've got here in, in, in uh, the Forest of Dean. And then, I it, um, you know. Say, but, uh, I'm, sorry, I was just going to say, because of course you are a fantastic bird watcher. Like you've, you've got an encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> and you had one, you had one hell of a garden tick this year. Did, was it, it was this year, wasn't it? I haven't made this. Yeah, yeah. Now. It was I'm March, March, March the 21st or 22nd, 21st, I think it was. Yeah. So basically I was just, I was just coming into the house, looked up and at the height of say, you know, like a Douglas fir tree. So not, we're not talking like really super high. Um, was this, was an eagle. <laughs> and it was an immature white tailed eagle. And yeah. uh, I was calling my wife to come down managed to get a couple of shots of it as it moved away 
and and then as the story unraveled it became clear that it was one of the the um tagged birds from the isle of wight mm. and it had actually been roosting in oxfordshire it had been um into wiltshire it then visited the slimbridge wildfowl weapons trust earlier that day and by three o'clock in the afternoon it was above our house and when i then got to see the tracking of the bird one of the beeps, one of one of the um, signals that got sent to the mobile transmitter was our house. <laughs> so there was brilliant. complete proof. There was complete proof that I wasn't just making it up. Yeah, um, it then headed over. But what was also really exciting was it then headed over towards Yat Rock, where there were some raptor watchers who who also spotted it. Then it was seen near Ross and Y, and then and then over the following two weeks or three weeks, it then headed up to Yorkshire. Um, but I just was, I couldn't believe it. I mean, how often do you get a white-tailed eagle over your house that's not in the Isle of Mull? <laughs> yeah, exactly, never. <laughs> really also, never. What's, what's the probability of me? I mean, if I had been two minutes early, I would have been inside the house and missed it. Exactly. So yeah. I happened to be, ju you know, just outside the house, look up at the right moment that eagle went over. It was fabulous. Well, I'm an optimist, and I always think that is because you've spent so many hours sat watching nothing when you're monitoring other raptors and nothing's come off, that every now and then you get that little, you yeah, know, little, golden, um, golden yeah. moment to say, well done for all those hours of sat looking at nothing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, good, good work. Because, of course, I, I can't not mention as well, um, you're a tour leader. And, and that includes the UK as well. So yeah, tell us a right. bit about tell us a bit about your your tours all over the globe, and then what you're doing in the UK. Give that. A yeah, pause. so I've been well, I've been tour guiding now for Nature Trek for the last twelve years or so, and so I take people all around the world and in the UK to see wildlife. And um, although birds is one of my specialist areas, I like to, I like to lead tours that incorporate lots of other wildlife, particularly cetaceans, whales and dolphins, but can be other things as well. And that's just because it, it you know it attracts a nice kind of cross section of different people. And also, I, I you know, although birds are one of my specialist areas, I, I, I have real I get real joy from seeing butterflies, mammals, whatever it is from around the world. And I've been lucky enough to go to the Arctic and Antarctica, Madagascar. But actually, and I love those places, don't get me wrong, but I love, for example, being in Romania and the Danube Delta, just being surrounded by reed bed birds and cuckoos and snakes and being up in the Carpathians looking at bears. So you don't always have to go that far from Britain to, I think, enjoy wildlife. And then actually here, here in the Forest of Dean, I've started doing wildlife safaris with, um, with the Tudor Farmhouse Hotel. Uh, I also do private ones as well, but that's all about just showing people the fabulous wildlife that's here in the Forest of Dean. People come here wanting to see deer, fallow deer, they want to come and see the wild boar, uh, but also for me it's about opening up their eyes and you know I often get people coming for example from London who've never been in a woodland at night, so actually they, they might come originally to wanting to see boar, but actually for them it, I think they go away having enjoyed the whole kind of woodland experience you know actually coming into the woodland the forest being there in the evening at dusk we don't always see boar we don't always see deer so it's actually about that whole atmosphere and environment you know occasionally we see the odd goshawk occasionally we see other things but it's it's about being honest with people and saying look you know there's no guarantee but but hopefully you'll still have a, a, a an all-round good experience as well Brilliant. Yeah, well, we'll um, I'll make sure I get I, I'll, in the comments, I'll put your um, I'll put your web. We'll put the website up and make sure. Yeah, lovely. Make sure we put, plug that and, and the books as well. And I, and I also I, specialise a lot in bird song as well. So a lot of my work in springtime is is leading dawn chorus walks and taking people out, hearing bird song. And I do a lot of identification courses as well, particularly for the BTO, but also for wildlife trusts like the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. And so I get a lot of enjoyment out of that as well, taking people out and helping them to, to open their ears to birdsong. And I'm learning all the time. I mean, since coming to the Forest of Dean, I've really managed to get my ear around the spotted flycatcher, which has a squeaky call that sounds very similar to baby song thrushes, sounds very similar to the calls of robins. You know, so even, even now I'm still learning new sounds. And and actually, when I go tour leading abroad, it's really good.
for me because I'm put into the position of often my participants because when I go to a new country I'm listening to very unfamiliar birds and having to learn them and, and repeatedly yeah. ask the tour leader what they are so you know I'm never complacent about it you know I'm I'm always learning new bird songs and sounds even though I've been I do it professionally you know yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that, that we sort of brings us, we're nearly up to an hour, which I like to hear. So that brings us on to last the last question, again, which I always sort of finish on and ask everyone, what is your one, If you, it doesn't have to be one bit of advice, what is yeah. your advice for anyone, young or old, that wants to get, is just starting or interested in getting into the natural world? So maybe for birds of prey as we're on raptor but then you can give us one for general as well if you want yeah i would i would say just get yourself out there get yourself known by people locally or, or further afield and, and get involved with things you know when i was a teenager from my work experience i worked at a wildlife hospital looking after a whole range of wildlife from baby badgers to to uh, tawny owls and things like that i had woodpeckers attached to my chest trying to feed them you know um yeah. when i came to university i got in touch with various different researchers and i went out um helping to crowd hairs that were being tagged i was going out to help catch bats i was helping um, um a, a very good friend of mine today um rob thomas who was researching robins and 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 how they how they eat more food on a on when they can predict there's gonna be a colder night and eat less on another night you know and so that gave me a really kind of broad idea and i and i dabbled in things i did some work experience with the bbc which i didn't particularly enjoy and it gave me the chance to see i didn't really want to go into that yeah but i still stuck with the bbc and that actually what worked better for me was to be a consultant and to advise and to be uh, on the other side i didn't want to be actually in the production i wanted to be more as a consultant so yep. my advice really is to get out there dabble get a taster of things you know and see what you like what you don't like but also it gives you a really good chance to get yourself known and the one thing that i did i think from my mid-teens onwards was get myself known and even today there's people in the rspb who still remember me when i was 15 years old because i i talked to them and i got to know them and 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 that sort of stuff so you know so if you're particularly wanting to get into the world of raptors i you know it's about getting in touch with raptor groups and falconry centers and and you know getting on hands on and, and, and getting the experience of of working with those birds and and getting the field experience as well i don't think a lot enough young people i don't mean this in a patronizing way so apologies if it sounds patronizing, but i don't think enough young people ha have that and get that field experience and so i think you know it's getting out there you know getting getting to going out there with people that have got licenses so you can actually really understand how you find these nests what to look for and that will put you in really good stead then for for both training but also then actually getting jobs i think in the future as well it's you're you're absolutely right and and just when you were talking there about getting out there and and learning new things ed I, you know a classic example of that for me was when I moved down to Gloucester for three years and met Robin Husbands and he took me out uh, and when I first started monitoring gossels and interestingly the memory came up it was seven years ago the memory came up today my first gossel nest that I climbed to under license with Rob and when you go out with someone like Rob who really lives and breathes in the forest <laughs> yeah but people don't probably don't know who he is but the wealth of knowledge that he I learned from him just spending time oh, absolutely with I was asking him about cuckoos and tree pipits the other day you know because um there are some fabulous books you can tap into but also talking to field, amazing field workers like Rob that are out there all the time you can pick up some really amazing stuff as well so it's it's learning off of other people I think that's really important and and also yeah. the other the other thing because I remember being in my early 20s and thinking I'm better than everybody else and you know I can do this but it, I think the older I've got it's realizing really that you're you're learning all the time and that you're yeah. not necessarily any better than anybody else but you but you can still carve your own journey that complements what other people are doing and what have you you know what a brilliant way to finish <laughs> love it perfect right ed we're, we're about bang on an hour thank you for covering me when i dropped no problem I dropped out. <laughs> you're, you're a star um, once right. i realized you weren't coming back i just carried on <laughs> yeah you, you was you were spot on that was that was really good um right okay uh, thank you for your time no uh, problem thanks everybody for watching brilliant. Brilliant. all right Cheers, mate. take care bye-bye